In this lesson, we are going to discuss a topic that some of you may have seen before in a high school algebra class. And this topic is called conic sections. And the main reason to do this topic is to give you an overview of a topic that you're going to need to have some familiarity with in Calc 3. So first of all, what is a conic section? Well, geometrically, a conic section is a curve that's obtained when you intersect a plane with a cone. So a curve obtained when intersecting a plane with a cone. And by a cone, they mean a cone that has a top and a bottom. So that cone looks something like this, some kind of sort of hourglass figure. And if you look on Wikipedia or just Google conic section, you'll see a picture of what happens when you intersect that cone this way or this way or like this. So some familiar curves that you know are examples of the types of curves you get when you intersect this cone with this plane. And those curves are parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas. My suspicion is you're probably pretty familiar with this one, somewhat familiar with ellipses and less familiar with hyperbolas. And then lastly, all of these geometric objects, they have equations of the following form. Equations of the form ax squared plus by squared plus cxy plus dx plus fy plus g equals zero. And the only requirement is that a and b cannot equal zero at the same time. So any equation of this form where a, b, c, d, f, g are numbers could be, is a conic section. So why are these graphs important? So one thing that's important about them is that they form a complete characterization of curves of the form given above. Complete characterization of curves given above. i.e. if a curve is in that form, it implies you have a conic section. Or if you have a conic section, it implies the curve could be in that form. And another important reason to study them is that you will use these in Calc 3. to understand quadratic surfaces. And another reason is that they come up in applications. And you're living in one right now. Here's the Earth's orbit, here's the Sun, and there's the Earth going around the Sun in an elliptical orbit. The location of this Sun is at something called the focus of the ellipse, which if you've studied this before, maybe you know what that is. So our goals for this section are to have you be able to, when we're done, quickly identify which conic section you have. Is it a parabola, is it an ellipse, or is it a hyperbola? Be able to put that equation into the appropriate standard form and then make an appro appropriately detailed sketch of the curve it represents. And we'll go through an example of each of these. So first, parabolas. So the kicker here is that you only have x squared or y squared, not both, in your equation. And the standard form is y equals a 
x minus h squared plus some number, which usually is k. This is a, oops, I can't spell regular. This is a regular parabola. So y equals a x minus h squared plus k. As in this kind of thing or this kind of thing. There are also parabolas that are sideways. So instead of being functions of y, they're functions of x. And their equations are given by x equals a y minus k squared plus b. And those will be sideways parabolas of this form. So when you are making the sketch, the details that you have to have for a parabola is you must label the vertex. and you must label some other point. And because of symmetry, once you get one more point, you can get a second point, and a third point as well. So for the vertex, in this first case, the vertex is given by the point h comma k. And you can think this is a parabola that's been shifted over h and up k. And I'm sure that if you know if A is positive, you have a parabola opening upwards. And if A is negative, you have a parabola opening downwards. Positive A, happy parabola. Negative A, sad parabola. For this second case, the vertex here is actually given by, well, I ever use a different letter, but that B part is actually the X coordinate and k is the y-coordinate. And the way that I remember that is whatever variable that letter is with, or that number is with, corresponds to whether or not it's the x or y-coordinate. This k is with the y, it's the y-coordinate. This h is with the x, it's the x-coordinate. And these parabolas are sideways. If a is positive, your parabola should open in this direction. That's the positive direction in terms of the x-axis. And if A is negative, your parabola should open in this direction. So now let's look at a problem that is a parabola. So you have 2y squared minus 4y minus x plus 3 equals 0. So you can tell this is a parabola because only y is squared. Now the question is, how do you get it into standard form? And the common almost trick we almost always employ is to go into standard form, you must complete the square. Okay, so to do so, I'm going to move the x over to that side. 2y squared minus 4y plus 3 equals x. And the fact that I have x equals stuff with y squared tells me I'm going to have a sideways parabola, as in not a normal up and down, a side to side one. Now to complete the square, first take out this 2 from these terms. And now you have to add a number inside those parentheses. And the pattern is you look at this coefficient of the linear term and you half it and square it. So I'm going to add half of negative 2 is negative 1, which when you square makes 1. And notice that because this 2 multiplies by that 1, I've actually added 2. So to compensate, I take away 2. And now I have the parabola in standard form, 2 times y minus 1 squared plus 1 equals x, or x equals 2y minus 1 squared plus 1. The vertex is the most important point. So the x-coordinate there is 1, which is given by this number and the y-coordinate is also 1. So let's plot that point, 1, 1. And then to get one more point, just pick a y or pick an x to plug in. So let's pick 
y equals 0. And if we plug in y equals 0, we get x equals 2, negative 1 squared plus 1, or x is 3. So the point 3 comma 0 is on this parabola. And the line going through the vertex is a line that divides that parabola into two even halves. So this point will also be on the parabola. So here's a rough sketch of what that parabola does. And one sort of reasonable sanity check for you is that given that this number is positive, you know your parabola should be opening in the positive x direction. Now, had in order for this parabola to have been a sort of right side up parabola like that, the y would have had to have been not squared and you would have had to have had an x squared term. Right, next we have ellipses. So the standard form of an ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. This is an ellipse that's centered at the origin. Note that if a equals b equals r, this is a circle with radius r. Or more generally, if something is not centered at the origin, this guy, x minus h squared over a squared, plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. This is an ellipse centered at h, k. So the sketch details you, that you have to have are the points on the major axis. This is the longer of the two and the points on the minor axis, which is the shorter of the two. But once you get your ellipse into one of those two standard forms, it's actually quite easy to find the points on the major and minor axis. They're very related to these numbers, a and b, and we'll show you with an example. So the way that you know you have an ellipse First of all, you know this is not a parabola because you have both y squared and x squared. Then the next thing you should do is get x and y on the same side. So this is the same thing as x squared plus 16y squared equals 4. And at the stage you see that x squared and y squared are added, that's how you know you're going to have an ellipse. The last thing to do now is to get this equation into standard form by dividing by 4. So that gives us x squared over 4 plus 4y squared equals 1, which I know this is going to seem funky, but I'm going to rewrite that as x squared over 4 plus y squared over a quarter equals 1 or that's x squared over 2 squared plus y squared over a half squared equals 1. Now let's figure out where some points are. A really useful trick when you're looking for something's graph is to plot the x and y intercepts. So first let's set y equal to 0 and see what happens. If y is 0, this term goes away. We end up with x squared over 2 squared equals 1. So x squared equals 2 squared, and therefore x equals plus or minus 2. So the points 2, 0 and negative 2, 0. Let's actually count by 2s as well on this picture. Or, sorry, by 1 halves. So 1 half 1, 1 half 2. our two points. You, it's pretty obvious, I think, that this number is the square root of that number, and that's always going to be the case. You go from your center 
out root of what's under x over root what's under x. Similarly, we can find the y-intercept by setting x equal to 0. Well, then we get y squared over a half squared equals 1. So y squared equals a half squared, or y equals plus or minus a half. So the points 0 plus minus a half are also on this ellipse. That point and that point. And here's the graph of your ellipse. The major axis is this long axis, and the minor axis is this short axis. And the final conic section is a hyperbola. So a hyperbola is something, a, a conic section whose equation works out to be something of the form x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1, or y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. More generally, these things can also be sort of, those two are both sort of centered at the origin in some way. It can also be shifted, and that would be something of the form x minus h squared over a squared minus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1, or y minus k squared over a squared minus x minus h squared over b squared equals 1. Okay, so these hyperbolas have a sort of a different shape to them. When the x squared is positive, you're going to have x-intercepts and your hyperbola looks something like this. And there are going to be these asymptotes that have some relationship to the a and the b. In the second case, your parabola will be a vertical parabola that looks something like this. Or not parabola, hyperbola, excuse me. So if y squared is positive, that x squared is positive at that. And that you can confirm by trying to find intercepts by letting x equal 0 or y equal 0. So the things that you must sketch in this, you must sketch the vertices of each half of the hyperbola. And those vertices are these points, sort of the uh, the points at the end of the hyperbolas. And you must label your asymptotes. All right, so here's an example of a hyperbola. So we have x squared minus 2x minus 4y squared equals 3. So to get this in standard form, we're going to have to complete the square. And so I left a space on purpose. Here we're going to add 1. And we can either subtract 1 from this side or we can add 1 to the other side. And that gives us x minus 1 squared minus 4y squared equals 4. Dividing by 4, we have x minus 1 squared over 4 minus y squared over 1 equals 1. Now the first thing to notice here is that because this isn't just x squared over something minus y squared over something, because there's that minus 1 there, this thing is off-centered. So the center of this ellipse, instead of being the origin, is the point 1, 0. So that's the first thing to note. Next, let's find the vertices. So because the x squared is the positive part, we do this by solving, by setting y equal to 0. And that gives us x minus 1 squared over 4 equals 1. x minus 1 squared equals 4 x minus 1 is plus or minus 2, so x is 1 plus or minus 2, or either 3 or negative 1. 
So I have the points 3, 0 and negative 1, 0. And the asymptotes for reasons that we're not going to go into are always going to have a slope that's equal to the square root of the number that's under the y, so in this case 1, over the root of the number that's under the x, so 2. And the way to graph these asymptotes actually is to go to your center point. So let's put that center point there. And then to just go from that point and use a slope plus or minus a half to get the lines. So rise 1, run 2. Rise 1, run 2. So there's one asymptote. And then negative 1 half, sink 1, forwards 2. And there's your other asymptote. And those asymptotes fence in your hyperbola and it will look something like this. It approaches those asymptotes as x goes to infinity. Actually, the way to sort of prove this happens is to take that equation, solve for y, and then take x to infinity. And that will get you these asymptotic equations. But this pattern always holds. Okay, so for all of these following examples that you should try working before looking at the solution, first identify the type of conic section that you have, put the equation into standard form, and then make an appropriately detailed sketch. Okay, so once you have x and y squared in present in your equation, you either have a hyperbola or you have an ellipse. If this had been plus, we would have had an ellipse. Because it's minus, we have a hyperbola. Okay, and then given that you have a hyperbola, does it open left-right, like the previous example did? Or does it open up-down? Well, because the y squared is positive, this opens up-down. Okay, step two, get the equation into standard form, which in this case just means get it equal to one. So that's going to be 4y squared over 16 minus x squared over 16 is one, or y squared over four minus x squared over 16 equals one. Okay, step three is to make a graph. So in this case, the center is 0, 0. So I'll just draw that in. So the next thing you need to do is find the vertices. In this case, because we have an up-down parabola, they're going to be y-intercepts. So set x equal to 0. And that gives us y squared over 4 equals 1. y squared is 4. y is plus or minus 2. So vertices at 0, negative 2, and 0, positive 2. And then the asymptotes, at least their slope, is plus or minus. The root of the number under y, so root 4, over root 16. So once again, plus or minus a half. So from your center point, graph a line with that, going through that point with slope one half. So there's one asymptote, and then a line through that point with slope negative one half. And this, this hyperbola is a lot sort of wider than the previous one. It does approach those asymptotes as x gets large.
All right, looking at this one, you can see that you only have a y squared, and then the only x variable that's present is x. There's no x squared. So that means that you're going to have a parabola. And because you have y squared, you know it's going to be sideways. And in order to tell if it's sort of opening in the positive direction to the right or negative direction to the left, you actually have to get this in standard form. So let's work on that part and then go back to part one. So this is the same thing as x equals negative 6y squared plus 36y minus 55. So just left the x alone and everything else on the other side. To complete the square, I take out the negative 6. And now I add half of negative 6 squared inside those parentheses, so that's 9. And because of this negative 6 out front, I've actually added negative 54. So to compensate, I have to add positive 54. All right, this becomes x equals negative 6 times y minus 3 squared minus 1. And the fact that this is negative tells us that this parabola opens to the left. All right, so there's your standard form. Now the important points to plot are the vertex. Well, the number with the y gives you the y-coordinate is 3, and the x-coordinate is negative 1. So negative 1 up 3. Okay, and then just get one more point. I just think we could do it by, well, plugging in y equals 0 is going to throw us way the heck out there. So that was y equals negative 1. Let's just plug in something, or y equals 3. Let's plug in y equals 2. As you can see, we're at y equals 3 right now, so y equals 2 ensures won't be super far away. At y equals 2, we get x equals negative 6 times 1 squared minus 1, so x is negative 7. So negative 7, 2, that point there, this point here, and here's your parabola. Much narrower than the previous one. The bigger this number is relative to 1, ignoring the negative sign that is, the narrower your parabola will be. Okay, well here we have x squared and y squared. That means we have either an ellipse or a hyperbola. And because when x squared and y squared are on the same side of the equation, because they're added, we know this is going to be an ellipse. And now let's complete the square to get it in standard form. So gather the x terms together. 25x squared plus 50x. Gather the y's together. 4y squared minus 16y equals 59. Take out greatest common factors from each of those sort of groupings. 25 times x squared plus 2x plus 4 times y squared minus 4y. And then add numbers to inside both of those sets of parentheses. So in the first one we'd add 1, and the second we would add 4. And the numbers we've actually added to the left side are 25, so balance that we had 25 to the right, and 16. So that's 25 times x plus 1 squared plus 4 times y minus 2 squared equals, well, 59, 25, and 16 looks to be 100. And then dividing by 100 to make this equation equal to 1, we have x plus 1 squared over 4 plus y minus 2 squared over 25 equals 1. Okay, step three, get the graph. So the center of this ellipse is negative one, two.
Okay, and here's a super, super nice shortcut trick. The root of this number tells you how far to go out in the x direction. So because this 4 is 2 squared, you go over to the right 2, over to the left 2 from your center point. To get the y, you take the square root of that number, and you go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here is your ellipse. You could confirm this by plugging in x equals negative 1, because that will zero out the first term. Or you could plug in y equals 2, because that will zero out the second term. You'll get the same conclusion. You can see that these two points are the points where x is negative 1, and these two points are the points where y is equal to 2. All right, well, it isn't really obvious what this is because although we have x squared and y squared, they're on different sides of the equation. So to make the conclusion about what kind of conic section we have, we've got to move them on to the same side. So we have 9x squared minus 4y squared minus 36x minus 8y, we'll just say equals 4. And the fact that there's a minus separating the x squared and y squared tells us that we have a hyperbola. And given that this is a positive number here, this tells us, and this x squared is positive, this tells us that this opens left, right. Okay, now let's complete the square to get this into standard form. So you have 9x squared minus 36x minus 4y squared minus 8y equals 4. So take out the 9, and we get 9x squared minus 4x. Take out the negative 4, negative 4y squared minus 2y. And then inside the first group, we're going to add 4 half of negative 4 squared. Next group we add 1. Notice we've actually added 36 for the first one and actually taken away 4 for the next one. This gives us 9 times x minus 2 squared minus 4 y, oh this should have been plus, y plus 1 squared equals 36. And dividing by 36, we have x minus 2 squared over 4 minus y plus 1 squared over 9 equals 1. And that's standard form. Okay, and lastly, you get our graph. So the center of this hyperbola is the point 2, negative 1. Okay, the vertices, well, you can kind of do this the same way that you look at an ellipse. You could figure this out by plugging in y equals negative 1, because that zeroes out this y term, and you end up with x minus 2 squared over 4 equals 1, x minus 2 squared equals 4, x minus 2 equals plus or minus 2, or x equals, well, 0 or negative 4. No, 0 or 4. So we go over nothing, down 1. Where's our 1 vertex? Over 4, down 1. And notice that this is kind of like an ellipse. This point is a distance of 2 away. This is a distance of 2 away, which is the square root of this. And then the slopes of the asymptotes are given by plus or minus root of 9 over root of 4. So plus or minus 3 halves. And both lines go through this point. 
So you could just start at this point, that center point, and rise three, run two. Sink three, back two. So there's one asymptote. There's another. And roughly speaking, there's your hyperbola. So hopefully that gets you enough to kind of get a general idea of the gist of these things. And if you want to read more about them, your book goes through in a lot more detail. And also, if you find a good Algebra 2 textbook, they will have a good explanation of why some of these tricks work and may even give you some ideas for shortcuts that you didn't learn in this lesson. And with that, you have learned everything you need to learn this semester. So now it's just time to study for your final. Way to go. Well, and take one last quiz.